It's Friday evening. I'm Devi. Thanks for choosing to spend this cold winter's evening with us. It's our third episode, and for those of you still unfamiliar with our vibe, for 30 minutes, we fight the good fight, then chill with unique South Africans. No COVID-19 news here, if that's what you're looking for. The 30 minutes fly by, so let's get to our lineup. Johannesburg residents claim that in some cases, the Metro Police are doing fake breathalyzer tests. You're not scared of the Tsotsis that are doing smash and grabs and a hijack. You're scared of the JMPD. Correct. Then, South African designer to the stars, Khat Johan Kutsir spills the tea and dishes out a few juicy deets. The bride's mother is always the one freaking out and the bride is sitting here like, stop it, mommy! I can't... <laughs> the, the most difficult client is the matric dance girls. First up, we're a nation of people who drink and drive. South Africa has one of the highest rates of road fatalities in the world. Driving drunk contributes massively to those stats. So we need to welcome roadblocks. The more, the better. Arrest drunk drivers, prosecute them, and send out a strong message. But in this story, JMPD officers stand accused of intimidation and conducting fake breathalyzer tests. On the 14th of June, Charles Castle and his fiancée Chloe Roberts were driving home from his mother's house when a flashlight appeared suddenly just outside Four Ways Hospital. So when I then saw the car, I said, OK, this is police. So I pulled over and they then approached me at the driver's side and then requested my driver's license from me. And then they knocked on the window and said, I have to get out of the vehicle. And he then instructed me, we're now going to do a breathalyzer test. I was watching the entire time in the wing mirror, you know, obviously just to see what was transpiring. I was a little bit concerned that they were taking a bit long. Then when I stood next to the bucky, another officer exited the bucky and then produced the officer giving me the instructions with the breathalyzer, um, the machine. I took the machine, I blew on it, and I wanted to hand it back to the officer. He then said, no, wait, look at it. Um, it is going to tell you a story. Then shortly thereafter, it came back, said alcohol detected. The actual word says alcohol, alcohol detected. detected. There's no number. Mm. I came to the back of the car because I wanted to see what is actually going on. And the officer was... I could see it was very hostile, like arrogant. The officer then um, stood around, I don't know, spoke in a language I didn't understand. And after a, a short while, the other officer also approached and started making remarks, saying, yeah, this is the one that's drinking. And he just said, um, take my car, they want to arrest me for alcohol. They, they're just going to go and do blood samples. So I thought, OK, that's now a bit drastic, because knowing from where we both come from, it was there was an innocent trip. There has been no alcohol in the last 24 to 48 hours. I requested the officer to show me the breathalyzer, the yeah. calibration certificate. Yeah. He then showed me this, the system itself on the machine. He says it has been calibrated, so he showed me a date. Attorney Carl Schuller has dealt with hundreds of drunken driving cases over the years and says this incident raises questions. In an informal kind of setup, the police have to give you, or they have to satisfy you, that there's some kind of reasonable suspicion why they pulled you off. If they can't satisfy you, you can refuse to be breathalyzed. Is this common? Have you heard of this before? These, oh. these so-called allegedly fake breathalyzer tests and then when you chuck back, they get a bit scrick and say you might as well leave. To extort a bribe? Uh, most certainly. So this, look, this has happened before? Bribery, extortion and corruption is rife in South Africa. And, um, you know, it's something that really must be addressed head on. Also a lawyer by profession, Charles offered to pay for his own blood test. So I said, then let's immediately go, arrest me, and then we can go and do the blood. My concern was firstly that there's something wrong with the machine. I don't usually think that, but knowing from where we, we had been, um, you know, your natural person will question and go, but where is this coming from? They after they handed me my license back and they said I can go. This in the same week a cyclist was killed by a drunk driver just a few hundred meters from where this incident took place. Absolute anticlimax, if I can say that, um, because now you, you're preparing, OK, we're going to go and do this, we must now do a blood sample um, because there's not something wrong, and then they just go, well, you can just, you can go. That for me is not right. It's something that's, uh, that probably concerns me even more and actually angers me because it's not, you shouldn't, if that was a drunk driver in, you know, a gen, genuine case, 
they shouldn't have been put back on the road. Frustrated, Chloe put up a warning post on Facebook and was inundated with responses. Going through every single post, seeing that everybody has had, you know, maybe a similar experience, well, not everybody, but a lot of the people, um, and also just sort of that community wanting to come together and warn one another and stand together, I thought that was something to take back from. Same. My reading came to 0 0.37. <laughs> That's an unconscious state and death is fast approaching. They only operate at night and are extremely aggressive. They fiddle those breathalyzers, they even have their own to make money. I demanded to have blood work done, but he just kept on telling me how I'm going to get raped in jail that evening. A Four Ways Hospital doctor who asked to hide her identity for fear of victimization says she's regularly harassed by the Metro Police in the area, often late at night. In the last 18 months, things have gotten really out of hand. How many times has this happened to you? Um, 20 to 25. In the last 18 months? Yes. It's actually going to mean for the community that someone like me, who does a lot of after-hours calls, is going to refuse to come out at night because it threatens my safety. Let me get this straight. You work in intensive care at a hospital. You work long hours. But you now, when you get into your car every single night, already tired, you're not scared of the Tsotsis that are doing smash and grabs and are hijacking. You're scared of the JMPD. Correct. Did I get that right? 100% correct. Despite being a teetotaler, she says the JMPD also presented her with false positive readings on a few occasions. Six or seven times. That many. They will then tell me to open the window so they can smell me. It's unbelievable. And then you get this face coming at you and this huge so, nose that sniffs you. So now you're woofing on somebody. Absolutely, face. absolutely. It's beautiful. Why would they want to put themselves through that? I don't know. Because clearly, for those people who have had a drink, and are feeling vulnerable, the business becomes worthwhile. A few hundred rand will get you off. Both residents say the officers refuse to identify themselves. So I said, yeah. well, if you're going to arrest me, I want your service numbers and I want your uh, full names as well. And I also didn't get that. They don't give you any details. They don't volunteer any. And frequently, they don't even ask for your details. Were there any female officers? Never. What does it feel like in that moment? I mean, you're a doctor, you know what your rights are. What does it feel like though, if you, when you're alone in the car and this happens? It's enormously threatening. This is why I say to you that driving home is very stressful, anxiety provoking episode. So if you get into a situation where, let's say you're a lady driving alone at night and you've got two male policemen that pull you off, that's something that you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. And you should say to them, listen, I insist on having a female officer come and process me and do the necessary. We approached Johannesburg Metro Police Department spokesperson Wayne Minar and shared the complaints. We have now made them aware yes. of uh, the allegations and that area there yes. in front of the four ways of the hospital yes. is being monitored. He asked them for their details, they refused to give it. They're, 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 uh, the officers were wrong. Yeah. If an officer is requested for his uh, yeah. details, the officer has to produce. Yes, we know that. No calibration certificate is given to the, the complainant, and he asked for it on numerous occasions. He asked to go and do a blood test at Four Ways Hospital, which is within walking distance. The minute he says that to them, they then ask him to leave, to go home. That is wrong. That is wrong. That is why we need information about this incident so yeah. that it can be investigated. One of the things that I now do as I leave work is I phone somebody because I found that on these occasions where I have been forced off the road and intimidated, it definitely acts as a deterrent. After the break, but what could make a breathalyzer give a false reading? We put some common household products to the test. Oh, oh 0 0.4. Back to our story. To remind you, the allegations from many quarters are members of the JMPD have been pulling over unsuspecting drivers, intimidating them and doing fake breathalyzer tests. 
we decided to do some breathalyzing of our own. As Charles and Chloe mulled over their experience, they wondered how the JMPD had come up with the false alcohol reading. Then a thought struck them. Maybe sanitize the machine, maybe that's why the alcohol reading came up. That's not so far-fetched, says Carl. If that machine has been sprayed, it may give you a false positive. So even the slightest little bit getting blown into a machine, might, you might have a situation where you have a false positive. The American Journal of Infection Control recently published an article about research which bears this out. But are there other products that could have a similar effect? Remember that hot cross bun video which blow, went blow, viral? Blow, 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 There you go. Now let's see. <laughs> if you had a quick uh, swizzle of Listerine prior to leaving the house, and if you eat uh, very ripe fruit, um, so there's certain things that can cause false positives in breathalyzers. Normally something that you've eaten or something that you've taken which will contaminate your mouth with alcohol should be done in, in, in a couple of minutes. We asked a few staff members to help with this experiment to see which everyday consumables can give positive readings on a breathalyzer. So we're going to do this test, right? So you can sure. see I've got a clean one here for you. As a base measurement, each participant blew into the breathalyzer using a fresh straw. Isal has been a very good girl. But Joy is very proud of this. Zero. Right. It's 0 0.01. You had wine last night. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I had cognac. Ha! Okay. You're honest. First, we tried cough mixture. Standard dose of 10 milliliters for an adult. Zero point two seven, wowzers! The legal limit is zero point two four. We also tested cough syrup, and it gave us a reading of zero point two seven. We can we can do the test and. Yeah, we've done the test. We've we've done the test. That's how we we know what we're doing. Mouthwash next, and we know mouthwash does have alcohol in it. But is it enough to give a substantial reading? All the corners, Pajoy. I'm happy. Right. The things I get you guys to do for me on the television, I must be honest, right? Oh, oh! 0 0.4. That's 0.16% over the current legal limit. So you're going to have to mouthwash bottles to be able to reach 0 0.24. When you're wrong. You left to you left to ah, you left no. to use no, 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 wait. Don't, don't. bottles and bottles of no. mouthwash no, no, in I, order to reach just, 0 we, 0.24. No, we just use two caps. Normal amount in the mouth. Yeah, but the legal limit is 0 0.24. So that person was still 0 0.20 under the limit. No, 0 0.4. This person was 0 0.4. The reading was 0 0.4 after using mouthwash. You see, yeah, you see what I'm saying? If you do a breath, uh, breathalyzer test immediately after using the mouthwash, it will give a reading. And a high one? Immediately. Remember that, after lockdown, before you head out on your next hot date. But if you are stopped and suspect foul play, lodge a complaint with the traffic complaint line or iPad. It's a common thing that happens, you know, to a, to a lot of people, and um, we also lodged the complaint with uh, with the head of the JMPD um, through through sending them a formal complaint on email. So we haven't received anything back yet. We've got a very fair constitution. We've got measures in place. We've got uh, the independent police investigative um, directorate, which follows corruption, follows extortion. If you come across an officer who is corrupt. If the officer must conduct himself anyway, yeah. if they're trying to extort money yeah. by giving false information on a breathalyzer, report the officer okay, so, so that the officer can be investigated we... and so that the officer can be dismissed. But for our doctor, she has lost trust in the JMPD. Why have you never ever reported it to the JMPD? Because it's just waste of time. Whatever I report yields no results. I feel like they're all in cahoots. This is organized criminal activity. 
report your incidents to the JMPD. You must, because it's the only way to track and trace officers on the scene. But reliable breathalyzer tests are essential. We can't have situations where officers are abusing their authority and could be letting drunk drivers off the hook. We know this happens around the country. So share your stories with us via social media. Coming up after the break, his name is Gert Johan Kutsia. He's from Koster, a small farming town in the northwest. And let's just say when they made him, they broke the mold. This is one of my favorite parts of the show, where we have a bit of fun. Designer Gert has fashionistas all over the country weak at the knees. And I recently met him and realized very quickly that even a pandemic couldn't make him lose his sparkle. Fabulous, fearless, fashion forward. Gert Jan Kutier is a household name and his clients are world famous. For nearly a decade, this South African designer has dressed women from runways to red carpets. His clients are starlets and influential leaders. Khatjan Kutsia creates everything from show-stopping wedding gowns to chic at leisure. All from his trendy Johannesburg studio. I have one confession. I always wanted to meet you. Even me, like I am such a fan. Like as I'm sitting here, I'm like, oh my word. <laughs> You're not scrap or anything. I'm very scrap, yes. No, I'm very, very, very worried that it's going to come off any moment and you're going to ask me, Hat, why do you charge this much for a t shirt? What's wrong with you? Well, actually, it was oh, goodness. number four, but we don't have to worry about that now. <laughs> so I've always wanted to meet you for one reason. Um, I wanted you to make a dress for me so that I could wear it to some glam event. Of course. So now there are no glam events. And I'm meeting you. So are you okay to sign off like an I or you or something? <laughs> well, we're going to have to speak to my lawyers. <laughs> what is it about a Khat Johan Kutia outfit? Hmm. You know, I think it is the way it makes a person feel. Like, um, I think it is really trying to capture the essence of the person wearing it. Um, and it's bring the best side out of them. And you pair that with the snatched waist and everybody feels beautiful. But how do you even design? Because I'll tell you, a lot of people would come in here with ideas. I want this, 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 and this. And it's often ideas you saw work on somebody else. So, Which won't work on you. <laughs> that's always the fun thing. We get lots of Kendall Jenners, Bonangs, Minis. They all want to look like that. But um, in the end of the day, I always listen. I think that is the key to working with lots of women is listening. So for the first... Just repeat that for our <laughs> male audience. Just say it slowly one more time. The key to working with women is you have to listen. <laughs> Brides wise, do you get to see a lot of bridezillas? You know, the brides in general are fine. Um, the bride's mothers or mothers in law? The, the bride's mother is much worse. The bride's mother is always the one freaking out, and the bride is sitting here like, stop it, mommy. Like, I <laughs> but uh, the, the, the most difficult client is the matric dance girls. I think, really? yeah. I think brides, by the time you're a woman marrying a man or marrying another woman or whatever you're marrying, you are so confident in who you are as a person that the little insecurities doesn't bother you. So in a time like this, uh, where everybody's watching their bucks, what does it mean for you in your industry? Okay, so the fashion industry got completely knocked. What I've learned out of this is that I've always tried to diversify my portfolios, but what I didn't preempt is all events are cancelled. So that is a complete stop in everything that I'm working on and everything that I'm working on in the future. So what I've learned out of this is, is don't just have your income dependent on events. Um, and what we've kind of done uh, with this is we've started making beautiful masks. We just really try and make it 10% more fabulous than any other mask out there and people run for it. And that fabulousness extends to his personal style, as we found out. So I want you to see what's in your wardrobe. And then I realize you've got a big wardrobe. I've got a massive wardrobe. So 
to make my life easier, I said, bring the clothes here so that I can have a look. Let's go through some of your, your favorite, favorite items. You know, my signature look is always yeah. a hat shirt. So I love doing my hat shirt, especially for like the gram. You know, Instagram, you always have to sparkle and shine. Yeah. And this is one of my favorite pieces for that. Yeah, I feel just... like I want to touch it. It's you got that totally feeling it. of it's... like you want to touch it. You call this crystal rock. And you actually laser cut this out of glass crystals. Really? And then we have peak it on. Um, and I just love these shirts. So that's like my signature. And I have them in all the colors. But, but that's not the kind of t-shirt you can get two for hundred bucks, right? No. No. That's not your, your two for one special. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then, especially when we like changing seasons, I like to wear like a lightweight sweatshirt, like the um, hoodie. Yeah. A uh, tracksuit, excuse me, maybe. Yeah, size. yeah. And this is my new collection. And what I love about being a designer, I can literally kind of like wear off the runway when I want to. But yeah. loungewear is a thing now because everyone's working from home. Definitely. But you don't want to look like you're wearing pajamas. True, true. And then, you know, I don't always just wear hats. I love to shop vintage. This is my tails. This is Beautiful. one of my favorite jackets. Beautiful. But it's a statement piece, so I only get to wear one for twice a year. Yeah. Um, but this I also got in a thrift shop, and I just, I'm obsessed with it. And then this piece here started out as a headpiece for Bonan. Yes. So it was kind of like yeah. one year, okay. and then afterwards I thought, you know what, this is going to make a great tie. And that was kind of where it started. Because you are known for your neck pieces. I love a dramatic neck piece. I feel like whenever your, your outfit needs to be elevated a little bit, a neck piece does. Um, this is off the runway, and sometimes like the very, very special pieces I like to keep for myself. Um, and this jacket is definitely one of them. This yeah. was completely hand beaded, wow. and this is actually beaded with gold. And so it's always about finding inspiration wherever you go. And that's it. That's some of my, 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 my most favorite pieces. A signature look of that personal style, his perfect quaff. So that takes you an hour and a half per day. Definitely. I think I am such a perfectionist. And when it comes to myself, I really like it if things are like tip top and shape. And I always think is I can't tell people how they should look if I don't look like a designer. How does a guy who grew up in Costa, conservative town, sit here and be so strong and so unapologetically you? Thank you. Um, you know, when you, when you see a, a, a kind of like a sheet of beige paper and you put a pink drop on it, that is what I was like in Costa. <laughs> I was completely the contrast there. Like I was just something else. And, and of course I didn't, I loved it there and I loved going up there. And I think it gave me so much um, introspection, but it, it's definitely not for me. Small time life is not for me. I need the glitter and the sparkle. I'm also a small town girl and I must admit, I also like some glitz and sparkle now and again. Right, so we've set you up for the weekend. See you again next week, but until then, chin up South Africa. Let's keep our eyes on the horizon. We've got this. Mm -hmm.